many particle dynamics via differential inclusion. And it could just be like the rephrasing of the title of the paper that I'm going to describe a little bit more in detail, which is dynamics for a system. <coughs> of screw dislocations. So the dynamics is there and is done via differential inclusions and the many particle just sits in this little s at the end of the, at the end of the title, okay? So imagine you have uh, like a cylindrical body say with cro cross section omega so let's assume we have an infinite cylinder and that's omega uh, cross R. And uh, um, we model it as an elastic medium. So if we have uh, the deformation U uh, from the body into R3, uh, the classical equations for elasticity tell us that the divergence of L lie to the gradient of U is equal to zero if the body is in equilibrium. So U is the, uh, nabla U of course is the gradient of the displacement, L is the elastic tensor, which can be written in a convenient uh, coordinate frame as mu, and let me write it here, like, uh, like a diagonal matrix uh, one uh, with uh, elements one and lambda square. So lambda mu are the so-called Lamer constants of the material, and I'm using here a two-dimensional uh, representation because the type of deformations U that we're going to uh, consider are anti-plane shear. So U maps a point uh, X1, X2, and X3 in X1, X2, and uh, X3 plus U of X1 and X2. Meaning that uh, this is the type of deformation that uh, you're going to have when you have a piece of paper and you tear it apart to break it. Okay, so this allows us to uh, concentrate uh, on the two-dimensional domain omega, that's a subset of R2, and uh, at each point, the deformation is only going to point along the vertical, okay? So this is the equation that you're going to have if the, uh, if the material is, is unbroken, but since we are dealing with these locations, uh, uh, we can model them as failure at point uh, at which uh, the displacement here, the gradient of the displacement, fails to be actually real gradient, and therefore we have to use another, um, another way to model it. So let's consider a field H from omega into, uh, into R2, and uh, we're gonna rewrite this equation as the divergence of LH equals to zero, and then we have an extra condition on the curl of H, which has to be equal to the sum from I that runs from one to M, some element bi and delta to sense at the point zi. So let me uh, erase this picture and write it down as there. This is omega. We have point zi here. And uh, just looking at the cross section, we have that these are lines. These ones are lines along which the, the defects are located. And uh, at this precise point, uh, the field H is not a gradient anymore, otherwise its curl would be, would be equal to zero, but uh, uh, it fails uh, to be a curl, and this, the entity of the failure, so to speak, is measured by a little object that, that's called BI. So BI here should actually be a vector, uh, but given the anti-plane shear, can only be, ca it can be identified by a scalar along the direction of three. And this is what is, is called in the literature the Burgess vector. That's what measures uh, the rupture in the lattice uh, due, to that, due to the presence of the dislocation. And in our case, it points only up and down, and it's not restrictive to assume it to be equal to either plus one or minus one if the deformation is going upwards or down. Okay. Uh, the way we, uh, we approached this system was to set up a variational machinery, so find a functional uh, that we want to minimize in order to find uh, equilibrium configurations of, the, uh, of our body. And the functional is the one of linearized elasticity. So we have J of H, which is 
one half integral over omega uh, h dotted with that h and the x, just this, okay? Where the density would be w of h, one half h lh, which is a nice quadratic function in h, so we would like to hope like the existence of a unique minimizer that we can find uh, via the direct method of the calculus of variations. There is a problem though, because if one zooms in around a dislocation, say in a ball of radius epsilon centered at the dislocation at i, what you obtain is that uh, the energy of h, uh, say the energy j epsilon, that can be written as omega minus b epsilon of the die, and this is w of h dx. This one scales like a constant times the logarithm of epsilon. And this is the same behavior that Patrick uh, noticed yesterday in his graphs. Uh, and that's so if this is the, if you take the derivative of this, you have a, like a one over r behavior, and this is pretty much the, the same thing. So the, the idea to, to deal with this is uh, to get rid of the singularities. And the way we do this, or the way actually it's been proposed in a paper by Charmelli and Leone, 2005, and it should be as Time Journal on Mathematical Analysis, is to not to consider the domain omega, but to consider a domain omega epsilon, which is omega minus the union of some balls of radius epsilon centered at the point gi. And uh, to, to try and work out the, the variational machinery in this uh, perforated domain. So we want to find the minimizers h epsilon that are basically defined like Like the, uh, sorry. Like this. So if we find uh, a function j epsilon that minimizes this functional, we we are happy anyway. And then the hope is that we we can uh, take the limit for epsilon going to zero and see what happens in the in the puncture domain, so to speak. So when we take away only the dislocation points, so the the minimum of the functional j epsilon of h is sought for. Uh, where h belongs to a certain space. Uh, let me write it this way. And uh, all the uh, all the constraints that uh, we encode in the space in, the, in this space that we call h curl zero. So h curl zero of omega epsilon, or in general of a domain, we can define the as the functions that are in L two whose curl is in L2 as well. So you see that this is a slightly weaker notion, slightly weaker definition than uh, space H1 because you only require the curl of the, of the functions to be, to be in L2, so you can have cancellations when you take the, uh, the cross product for, for computing the curl, which is different from this very nice case where U is usually, uh, usually lives in H1, okay? And then we say that H curl zero is the set of the functions that belong to this space, which have curl zero, because now in the domain omega epsilon, we haven't got singularities anymore, so we hope to have uh, real gradients. But these real gradients need to satisfy some conditions because we need to remember that, they, uh, that the dislocations were there. So I forgot to mention it here. There's a way to compute in this number bi, which is taken uh, which is by taking the circulation around the boundary of this little ball of h dotted with dx. And so you in we include here the that notion, okay? So we have that here bi is given by uh, well, these are not u, actually these are fields h. dx. So now everything works fine for, uh, for using the, the, the direct method of the calculus of variations and we get 
H epsilon minimizer. of j epsilon over this space. And moreover, what has actually been proved already in the paper by Cermelli and Leoni, and they deal with the case of uh, edge dislocations, where the deformation is a little bit different like the one that uh, Patrick described yesterday. Uh, let me write it here. H epsilon converges to a final, uh, to a limiting strain H0 as epsilon goes, goes to zero uh, in the compact. in L2. So we have L2 convergence uh, in the compact set uh, of uh, basically the functional domain omega minus the collection of all the dislocations. Sorry, yes. Yes, because the, the functional is, is nice and quadratic, so you, have, uh, you do have a unique meaning. Yes, so the data of the, of the problem are uh, let's say a set, sexy Z, which is the collection of n dislocations, and the set of the burgers vector. So you have all these elements, you want to place the dislocation, I mean, it's not that you want to place them, it's not an optimal uh, design problem. You're given the positions of the dislocations with the burgers vector, and you want to see how they evolve if you start the dynamics from there. And, and to get to the dynamics, uh, I'll do it in a second, because all these elements of the variational analysis allow us to, um, to identify which is the force that moves the dislocations, that acts on the dislocations, and starting from there, uh, we want to write down a, a, an ODE, basically, for, uh, for the dynamics. Uh, well, if you do outside here, probably yes, but uh, I haven't specified any boundary conditions so far. So, yes. So, if you've got boundary conditions, you fall, and you haven't got any dislocations, you fall back into the uh, elasticity world, uh, and there's plenty of papers that, that deal with that. So. so, let me mention some. It depends on the numbers of dislocations and the and the uh, the burgers moduli of the of the dislocations. It's a, it's a I think you have to take like the sum of the bi squared or something like that. It's exp I mean we have it in the paper, but uh, what is important here is the behavior uh, with epsilon for what I'm going to talk about now, and then actually for the scaling limit purposes, the the constant might be important. What is it? No, we don't like this leading order. That's precisely the one that... Precisely, yes. But before getting there, I want to uh, tell you something more about the H epsilon up there. And uh, it doesn't hurt, and uh, we actually like this, uh, to try and write the H uh, that of which we take the curl as a contribution that comes from the presence of the dislocations. So this one roughly speaking, is the, uh, the strain generated by, uh, Ki is the strain generated by a single dislocation sitting at um, the point Zi. And something which is invisible to the curl. So we want to take the gradient of a function. If we do this, uh, we can try and uh, plug this, this information about H in the system up there. The curl equation isn't going to be modified, but uh, the, the elasticity one, the divergence of LH is, okay? And you, um, minimizes an energy, which is given by the integral over omega of uh, gradient of U L gradient of U. So actually I can also write it way, which is elasticity for, uh, for u, and then uh, a condition on the boundary of, of omega, which is uh, given by the, the action of the, of the fractions at the boundary. So u, uh, and here we have L sum of L, the ki is dotted with n, 
the, the surface area. Okay, which is the functional uh, whose Euler-Lagrange equation is the equation for elasticity for u. And then a Neumann boundary condition. On, uh, on the omega. And uh, if we do this uh, splitting of H into uh, some of the decay i's and the gradient of u, we would have to compute it in the boundary of omega epsilon. Then when we take the limit, uh, this passes to the limit in the boundary of omega. And uh, what is important there is that H0 will be written as the sum of the decay i's plus the gradient of the limit in u0 which is the one associated with this problem. So the minimizer here, say, produces the function u0. And with this element, we can, uh, uh, as precisely as you were suggesting, try to analyze the, the next order in the, in the expression there of the energy, which would be j epsilon of omega epsilon goes like the constant times the log of epsilon plus something which we call u that only depends on the positions of the dislocations plus order of epsilon. So whenever epsilon goes to zero, this term here will continue exploding and we don't like it, so we just disregard it. And this one will vanish with epsilon, so it's harmless. And uh, this one is what is called the renormalized energy. Okay, so that's the important part in, the, in what comes next. Because the renormalized energy, uh, we have explicit formulas for, uh, for, for it. Uh, and uh, we could say that U can be split into like, the sum of three contributions, uh, which we called US, UI, and UE, all of which depend uh, on the locations of the dislocations. So US is the self, so-called self-energy. It includes terms uh, that work like I have the expression as if you put the KIs in the W there, and uh, it's the, the energy generated by the presence of the dislocation. If you take uh, KI dotted with LKJ, you have the interaction term, which is the, uh, how each dislocation fills every other dislocation, and the elastic part here is uh, KI dotted with uh, L grad U, which is the, the, the contribution of the elastic part of the bulk uh, to, to the energy. Okay, I don't want to really go into, de into details about this. Uh, we have explicit expressions and I can give you references about those. Uh, what is important now is that uh, the, the way we compute the, the force acting on a dislocation is by taking gradients of the U with respect to the position. So this is contained, uh, this was proposed uh, to my knowledge by Cermelli and Gertzin in a paper dating back to 1999 from the archives. And uh, basically all our effort was to try and give a very f sound mathematical formulation of what they describe here. They describe a whole range of phenomena that happen in dislocation dynamics. So first of all, the equations of the dynamics. Uh, and then second, uh, some uh, um, funny behaviors related to when dislocations move along uh, lines that are not curved. And uh, I'm going to get into that in a second. So let's, before this, let, let me just do this. Pick a dislocation L. And uh, we define JL of ZL as the pitch colored force, uh, so called uh, acting on, on that, uh, which is the negative gradient with respect to the position of this of U of Z1, Zn. And this is the is the expression of the pitch and color force. So that it's the negative gradient with respect to this uh, dislocation position. So these are all vectors in R2, okay, uh, of, the, of the renormalized force. And this is what we use for uh, setting the, the dynamics because the wishful thinking, the formula we wish for, Is 
is to be able to write something like ZL equals something like this. Okay, unfortunately, this is not what is going to happen for a whole bunch of reasons. And uh, after cleaning the board, I'm going to. I'm going to say which the reasons are. So, so far I didn't, I was a little sloppy in mentioning how they, uh, how we model the material. We just said it's an elastic medium, but uh, as Patrick was mentioning yesterday when he was also explaining and showing how to bend the, uh, the, the, the paper clip or whatever that was, uh, the dynamics really happens at the, at the atomic scale. And uh, at some point, we need to take that into account. And this is done by, by imposing a condition that not all the directions are allowed for the motions, but only certain ones. So now the formula that I wrote down before, which I'm going to replace. This one is to be replaced because this is telling you that however the force JL is oriented, the dislocation will follow it. But we have to restrict the to a set G, which is given by G1 GM of glide directions and uh, GI is a unit vector for each, for each I. So the theory goes so far. Uh, these locations are, are good uh, um, models of defects in crystals and uh, periodic structures. So there's an underlying uh, crystalline structure to it, which carries uh, slip planes uh, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and these glide directions are meant to take that into account. So you can't just move along any particular direction, but you want to select the one that maximizes the dissipation. So the direction, let's say GL, along which the dislocation ZL will move is selected by a maximal dissipation criterion, which is the one along which you have the most force, right? So you want to write that G L of ZL is the argmax of JL of ZL dotted with G when G varies in G script. Okay, so we can't do this, but we say, okay, we, we allow our dislocations to move along a discrete and finite number of directions. Which one do, are we picking the one that maximizes the dissipation, which is measured by the scalar product? So far, so good until you realize that if, if you have your force JL this way, this might be G1, and this might be G2. If the force sits uh, precisely at the bisector of two, of two directions, and both of them happen to be maximizing, uh, maximizers, then here you have to, to switch the equal sign into to a uh, belongs to sign. And this creates uh, something that is not good for the differential equation because it gives a multivalued right hand side. Okay, so the formula that one now wants to write is ZL equals to JL dotted with the one that was maximizing along that precise direction. This is what you want. But then, in view of this, that you haven't got, to, you, you can possibly not have a unique minimizer, then this one needs, needs to be corrected. So this is 
a set. On the right-hand side, we've got a set. Okay, and uh, actually here, uh, let's call this object, uh, so let me rewrite it. So it's a set that uh, I'm going to call FL for the moment, and uh, I need to specify what FL is. But first of all, I need to highlight the dependence uh, on the dislocations, and this actually comes the uh, a capital Z, which is uh, a vector containing all the positions of the dislocations. And uh, from, from now on, we have to think of the dynamics uh, as a dynamics in in R two N. Yes. The glide directions are also known. Uh, yes, they can. Uh, so the glide directions are just given, say, are identified, are given by the, the crystal structure, the crystal instruction of the material. Okay, they, they, they take into account of the glide planes and where you can, you can have uh, motion in, in a crystal. Well, the glide direction that a dislocation picks, uh, that can change. Because at some point, uh, it can be convenient for that dislocation to stop following one particular direction, and uh, it maximizes more energy. It dissipates more energy if it follows a different one. And these are precisely the two, um, I say weird, but they are very much observed in the, in the experiments and in the numerical simulation behaviors that uh, Cermelli and Gertin were describing. So maybe I should mention here. Now, this formula here tells us that the dislocation, if it moves, it only moves along a straight line because its velocity is directed along a vector, okay? And this is the magnitude of the velocity. But you can observe uh, that at some point the dislocation moves and switches direction, which fails to be along a straight line in a hole, okay? Or it moves and then, let me see, and then it starts following a curve which is even a uh, behavior that's even more complicated than this one, okay? Here you say, okay, I'm just not happy with this direction anymore, let me switch, why not? And here, you're not following another direction anymore. Okay, so this is what they call cross-slip, probably because you go across a slip plane or something, and this is fine cross-slip. And uh, eventually, at the end of the talk, you'll see that we'll be able to model this into, uh, into a theory for, for the dynamics, for, for the dislocations. But to get there, the path is kind of complicated. So the idea now is to set up the dynamics in a nice uh, um, formalism. And for this, we're going to use the uh, um, theory about, uh, as I said, ODEs with discontinuous right-hand sides. And there's a book by Filipov that uh, describes uh, all the theoretical aspects that we're going to need in our, in our uh, study. And after that, uh, uh, existence theorems come and the uniqueness theorems come too. The existence is sort of easy. To prove uniqueness of the motion, we can only get to uniqueness forward in time. So if you, if you start observing your system, you know that you've got a unique solution if time evolves in the positive sense, and you can't say anything about going backwards. And uh, this allows to deal with, those, with these two cases as well. Okay. So now, the correct setting of the dynamics, or at least the one that makes the Filippov machinery work, uh, is the one where you take, where you study the system in omega to the n. So you go to a two dimensional, two n dimensional space, and uh, you call capital Z the vector where you list all the positions of the dislocations. And uh, I needed to do this because this FL actually depends on all the positions of the dislocations because the J does. So JL would actually be a function of the capital Z. We say L because it acts on the Lth dislocation, but as a dependence, it depends only, it depends on all the positions of the dislocations because, because of this. It's a derivative of the renormalized energy, which itself depends on all of them. So if I wanted to be precise, there's a capitalized Z back there as well. Okay, and uh, now it doesn't make any more sense to consider just one dislocation. So the dynamics that we're going to write down looks like capital Z dot 
belongs to F of capital Z with the initial condition. And this one is just F1 of Z cross product with F2, cross product with Fn. So this is the good starting point for the dynamics because this object now is funny, right? So F, F of Z can be the singleton zero if JL is zero. If, if no force happen, happen to act uh, on the dislocation or say the balance of the, all the forces is zero, the dislocation won't, won't move. So it's like that. Then we have that object down there, so JL of Z dotted with GL along the direction of GL. And this is a singleton as well. If JL is different from zero, and uh, let's say there exists a unique maximizing meaning that it maximizes the, the dissipation and glide direction. Or we have this other case, which is the trickiest one. We have JL dotted with, say, GL plus minus along GL plus minus. These are two elements. Same situation if there exist uh, two maximizing directions, which is the case where the J is directed along the bisector of two of them and those happen to be in a maximizing one. Okay, so if, the, if there were a third one here, of course the projection maximizes this one and this thing is meaningless, but they have to be both maximizers and uh, there's, there have to be two of them. Uh, and if you see it here at, at a point, you can have either zero or you have your uh, JL of Z dotted with GL along GL, or you can have two of them. This one, let's say, the one with the plus, and this one is the, wo the one with the minus. Uh, so in order to use uh, Filippov's theorem about the existence of the solution, we need to, to verify some conditions on the right-hand side, on the set that sits on the right-hand side of the, of the differential inclusion. And uh, these conditions are that the set needs to be non-empty, closed, convex, and uh, upper semi-continuous with respect to the Hausdorff metric. So all the conditions are pretty trivial to verify, actually, apart from the upper semi-continuity. Uh, but uh, uh, the recipe that we use for constructing this, this object here grants us that if we take the convexification of that guy, then it's going to satisfy all the properties that we need. So the, the final equation or inclusion that I'm going to write down is the one that we're actually going to solve. So we take the convex cell of f of z with the initial condition z times 0 equals z0. And this is the good equation that we want to use. Uh, we only have to be careful about one thing, and uh, I didn't go into the, this aspect so far, but I need to, to write it down. So we need to specify the domain of f, and the domain of f is omega to the n minus collisions. I didn't mention uh, anything about the regularity of the objects that are involved here, but maybe it's a good time to do this. So the j's and uh, the u0 happen to be analytic, and uh, in order to, to kick in this mechanism, uh, the uh, the existence theorem is a Peano type of theorem. So you have existence for a short time, and the, uh, the maximal existence time, of course, depends on uh, your Lipschitz constant. If you have any two dislocations sitting on top of each other, then the Lipschitz constant of the, of the force explodes to infinity because of the behavior of the, of the KI fields. Okay? 
the ki is say of z of x depending on the dislocation x i goes like one over the distance between x and z i and it's still the log type of behavior that you have uh, when you integrate this and this is not good because if the dislocations sit on top of each other you got this here at the denominator and you can't do this so you need to have some sort of safety buffer layer around uh, the diagonals of so say some some hyperplanes uh, where where any two coordinates or a couple of coordinates are equal in the two n dimensional space okay but if you stay away from collision from collisions then everything is gonna is going to work and we have a theorem which is existence of solutions for a short time okay so in our in our setting so if we take uh, the initial condition z0 to be in the domain uh, of of the right hand side if we want to solve that differential inclusion then we can do it uh, and at least one solution exists in theory many more exist and uh, for dealing with uniqueness uh, we're going to work a little bit more now but the existence is done because the way we constructed the right hand side as the convexification of, the of this Cartesian product grants us that the, the hypothesis of Philippov theorem are satisfied and also uh, we can sort of compute the maximal existence time uh, with the usual formula that is given by, uh, by in Peano type of theorem. So you have to locate a cylinder completely contained in your space-time uh, space uh, domain and, uh, and the maximum size of it is the one that was for giving you existence. So let's go to the, to the point of uniqueness now. Yes? Well, at this point, what makes existence stop is the failure of the, 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 the path Z of T to be in the domain of S. Yes, so if any two dislocations collide, uh, then the dynamics breaks down. And also, if a dislocation hits the boundary, the dynamics breaks down. Uh, this in a more subtle way, actually, because the dislocations are attracted to the boundary can be proved. And uh, I, I believe that Tom did some work on this at some point. Uh, so there would be no problem, but uh, you would have to dramatically change the space in which you're working. Because if you lose a dislocation, everything is going to carry an index n minus 1. And you would have sort of to freeze your dynamics and to restart it with one less dislocation and rewriting all the time. Uh, whereas if any two collisions, if any two dislocations collide, uh, this uh, is still out of reach. They can collide because of so uh, in, in the example that Patrick had yesterday, he mentioned that all the dislocations uh, were trying to repel each other and you have to do a great, deal, a great deal of effort to push them towards the boundary, towards the wall. That's because they all come with the same Burgers vector. And here, as I mentioned at the beginning, you can have Burgers vectors plus, man or plus one or minus one, and they behave uh, like uh, electric charges. So if you have two dislocations with the same uh, sort of deformation, then they will try to repel each other. If you have a plus and a minus one, they will try to attract each other. And that's the case when the collision can happen. Well, that would be the idea. So maybe if you're doing numerical analysis, you say, okay, they can get close to, I don't know, epsilon, whatever. Uh, and then from there, you can assume that a collision has, has happened. And then you freeze the system, you, you know, cross them out and you restart it with uh, uh, n minus two dislocations, maybe that you can do it, that you can do. But analytically, you can't. Uh, so the, the convex, w so the, the, when you take the convexification of that, uh, this one is the, is the middle case where you only have one direction and this one is the, is the second one. When you take the convexification of it, you get the segment whose endpoints are the tips of the arrows, okay? And uh, the theory goes, uh, defines a solution as one uh, for which, uh, in this case, Z of T is equal to one of the elements of the convexification. So maybe you, you can pick this element uh, and this, and this, this, yes, yes. So if the velocity is equal to either one of these 
well, if there's many points of the segment, actually, but you, that, that's the definition of, of, a, of a solution. It's a weaker definition of solution. So that is the thing, yes, this is the problem. And uh, the only way you can lose constraints, uh, the only case is when fine cross slip happens. Because in cross slip, uh, in the cross slip case, you just switch from one uh, possible direction to another possible direction, because this would be, say, G1. And this would be a G2 that both live in the, in the set of glide directions. Wherever in this case, this middle one is a tricky one. And will originate this curve in motion that I'm going to describe in a second. Yeah. So, uh, that is correct. We do not renormalize. So, it's moving slower. Yes. Yes. So uniqueness, uh, for treating uniqueness, we need, to, we need to deal with the case where uh, two directions are admissible for the motion. Okay, so let's analyze that, that uh, constraint a, a little bit more, or even the one in the argmax. So we have JL of ZL dotted with GL plus has to be equal to JL of ZL dotted with GL minus. Okay, now if you believe me, it's not very complicated to do. You can, you can do this. And this is equal to zero. And uh, for convenience, let's call this a vector J, G0. Okay, so this G0 is not necessarily a glide direction anymore. It's not even of norm one. Okay, but it's it's a condition here, and uh, we can we can try to st we can try to study we can try to study the set of points Z in our domain. So let's say such that J L of Z dotted with G zero is equal to zero, and we call this guy script A of L. A stands for ambiguity, so we decide to say, okay, uh, this location sits at an ambiguous point if there is at least uh, one of them whose force can, uh, uh, can lead it to move uh, along uh, two directions, okay? And then we say we take the union of all of them, of all of them, and we get the ambiguity set for the whole system. And uh, being able to give information about this object here is the trick to be able to, uh, to, to state uniqueness, okay? So first of all, this is defined via a, an equation. We could write it as phi L of Z equals to zero, where phi L is basically this scalar product here. And uh, uh, well, we use the implicit function theorem to try and, and say that AL is a nice smooth object. And this is what happens. So AL, or actually A in total, is A to N minus 1. Uh, so it should be rectifiable, basically. Uh, so like this. It's to N minus 1 rectifiable, and it's actually pretty smooth. Okay, because all, all the objects that, that, that are uh, playing here, the J's, are analytic, as I mentioned before. So regularity is not an issue. The dimension is, because we don't want this set to be too big, otherwise the dynamics would be meaningless. But it is 2n minus 1, so it's okay. Um, and uh, I just mentioned that it's rectifiable because we don't know how bad it can be, but you know, locally it is a piece of a smooth manifold, and maybe the JL can be something done like this, and we don't know. Okay, so the A can be something, something like this. But as long as you, as you stay in a neighborhood of a point uh, where you only have, say, one manifold that, that, uh, that you're considering, then, then everything is, gonna be, is going to be okay. So finding a point in AL is the one is, is, is dealing with this case, which is, which is what bothers us, okay? And uh, from this, we should be able to, uh, to identify the behavior of cross-slip and fine cross-slip uh, in the following way. So since it's rectifiable, 
it, it is uh, locally a manifold uh, and uh, we have a normal vector to it, okay? So the reason why I need a normal vector is because I want to decide uh, and to discriminate in which of the two cases I am. Um, so let's say that for this location L, this is, it's a ambiguity set and uh, here we have the normal vector to it. And uh, find, uh, so cross slip happens when, uh, so as I said here along AL, um, two directions are admissible, but uh, it can be proved that if only one direction is admissible, at least locally it is the only one that is admissible. So this means that on both sides of AL, I only have one glide direction that is, that is the maximizing one, the most dissipative one, okay? So if I sit at a point here, and uh, what I want to say is that if my system starts from here, follows this direction, then it hits the ambiguity set, and then all of a sudden the other dire direction is the, is the most convenient one, then the guy will switch. And the dynamics would be like that. Maybe I can do it in color. And this is cross slip. Whereas if the arrangement of the of the maximizing direction is, for instance, in this way, if I hit the glide direction coming from below, then when I'm above, at first I would be let to switch on the other on the other side, but the maximizing direction pushes me down. So this all in all is what gives me the motion along the curve. And uh, the precise way the convexification is built uh, and the conditions for the, for the dynamics tell me that it has to move along the tangent. Okay. And this is fine cross slip. And uh, so in Filippo's theory, these cases are included as, as general cases. And we showed that uh, our, our system exactly falls in, in those situations. For getting there, though, a little bit more work has to be done because we need to make sure that we don't get other bad points, meaning that we have to study the singular set SL, which is defined as the point Z in, uh, I would say, the domain of F, such that uh, they live in an ambiguity set, so JL of Z is equal to, dotted with G naught is equal to zero, and the gradient of JL of Z dotted with G naught is equal to zero as well. Then something which is not completely, let me say, cool with us is this zero here. If a dislocation doesn't move, and if we follow the recipe by the book, we would have to take the R max of these scalar products, but all of them would maximize it. So we don't like that, okay? So let's take E0, which is the set of the point uh, that we can take in, in the domain of F, or omega to the N, such that JK, probably I should write it this way, there exists AK in one and such that jk of z is equal to zero. So if there's at least one dislocation that doesn't move, we don't know how to deal with it because this right hand side, we would like to be a singleton, but all the directions are admissible, so we can't pick one either. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, let me. Yeah, okay, right. I think we had some problems with this. I need to uh, maybe think a little bit harder, but we needed to, to discard it for, for some reason. Uh, well, it, it is true that what you define on that side is zero, yes. Uh, Okay, I 
think about that for one second. And then in the first instance, we want to take also away uh, this E int, which is the set where we have intersections of ambiguity sets. Okay, so it's, it would be the set of all the dislocations, look, configurations, such that Z belongs to AL intersection AK for K different from L. So this is not a very big issue. We could actually solve it. But just to give you a clean uh, uh, presentation, let's assume in the first instance that uh, only one dislocation can undergo these weird motions, okay? Then what we have to analyze here is uh, okay. So let's call the right hand side F, which is the scalar product along the direction. And we want to see what happens to FL of Z dot N of Z. Uh, okay, so when we have two, we need to look at two. So we want to study this one and F plus L of Z dotted with N of Z, okay? And the difference here is precisely the sign of the scalar products uh, of, the, uh, of the velocity field of the dislocation when it sits on the ambiguity curve uh, with the normal, okay? So if we have that the one that comes, let's say that this is the negative side and this is the plus side. So here we have a positive scalar product and in this case, it's positive as well. So if they both have the same sign, either positive, positive, or negative, negative, this leads us to cross slip, okay? Because when you sit on top of here, you have your normal. This is the F minus, this one is the F plus, and they both have positive scalar product with the normal, or the other way around if the, the, the arrows are switched. But whereas, whereas, whenever, sorry, you have opposite signs of the projections, which is, so this case is the one in the picture. So the one that's coming from below is positive with the normal and the one coming from above is negative with the normal, or switched, then you have fine cross slip. And uh, you can actually know which directions they are following because you have to satisfy that uh, the elements F0 in the convexification of the right hand side that is picked for the direction of motion uh, is orthogonal. So the construction also tells you that you have to move along a tangent to the, to the ambiguity curve. And uh, so with this, I presented all the results uh, uh, on the theoretical side. I just want to draw one more picture to show you uh, what happens or how we could finally explain what was, uh, what has been foreseen by, by Surmeli and Gerfin, and uh, try to give you a hint on where these things can fail. Oh, I mentioned all these sets in the script because we need to assume that the, the initial condition belongs to the ambiguity set minus the collection of all those, okay? We said we didn't want to be in the singular set, we didn't want it to be in the intersection of two glide directions, of two, sorry, ambiguity surfaces. So let's say for an initial condition, which is nice enough, we can also establish right uniqueness of the, of the dynamics. And the picture that I like very much from the Cermelli and Gertin paper is something like, 
like this. So they have a big box that sits all around, which is omega. And for some reason, they say, let's assume that this dumbbell-shaped uh, curve is the, uh, is the ambiguity set. And outside of it, you have that the direction that is preferred is the one, say, along E1. And inside, you have the vertical one. So if you start the dynamics from here, you would move along this, then you hit the curve, and then you would switch to go down. When you get to this point on the other side, you can't go out because it would, you would be pushed to the right, and so you start moving along the curve here until you reach this condition where you have tangency. And if you notice here, the inequalities were strict. So when you have greater or equal, when you get to the equal sign here, it's when the motion, the type of motion changes. So here you would keep going out, and here again, this would be the path that the dislocation follows. Okay, whereas if you start maybe inside here, you keep doing this, and then you do the same thing again, and this situation. So there are these sort of slightly more critical points where you have tangency conditions, the one up here as well, and the one up here as well. The uh, Charmelli and Gerting call, call them grace points. And when you get at one of those, uh, you change the nature of your motion. And there are some other points that are tricky as well, which are, I believe, all these. Here, that are called sources. And this means that if you sit as, as an initial condition on top of any of these points, uh, there you really don't know where to go. And the set of sources has to be taken away as well from the, uh, from the initial condition, because in that case, the dynamics doesn't work. OK? So I forgot to mention that before, but I mentioned it here. If you sit at a source point uh, as an initial condition, the dislocation really doesn't know what to do. So you would have to hit it a little bit, but we don't want to do that. Uh, so where is the, the scaling limit? Well, this is in the perspective work uh, that I'm carrying on with uh, Giovanni Bonaschi and uh, Patrick Don Mers. We are trying to uh, formalize this uh, scenario, basically, in, uh, in the framework of gradient flows, because the dissipation condition nicely fits uh, for, for a gradient flow uh, framework, and also the fact that you get inclusions as opposed to uh, equalities in the differential sy in, in the ODE system is something that you very often find in uh, uh, when you write down something. UT belongs to the negative subdifferential of, of, of the gradient of your energy. So we would like to do that uh, and to give the formalization for this. Uh, there are some tricky points so far because the metrics that came up yesterday in some talks, the one that was called K, uh, was required to be uh, positive definite and uh, symmetric. In, the, in our case, uh, the, the metric that appears there uh, is only rank one. It's a two by two matrix, but it's only rank one because it's given by this projection condition along the, maxim, uh, the direction that maximizes the dissipation. And this gives problems for inversion. And uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that we're really interested in is to try and shoot n to infinity. So n here was, was fixed. And uh, see what happens when uh, uh, when n grows to infinity is uh, going to the world of plasticity and uh, see if from a dislocation dynamics you can, you can have uh, a plastic behavior of your material. That's what gives you that if you bend the paper clip, it doesn't bend back uh, when you release the, the force that you apply. Uh, okay, I think I'm done and I thank you for your attention. Uh, you can compute it, yes. We have some, ex yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you can do that. We, ha we have explicit computations for, uh, for uh, three or four different scenarios. So one thing that I should mention is that the domain omega that we consider, uh, for starters, is a bounded domain in R2. Uh, but we could work out by hand to some cases where you have that omega is a half plane, for instance. And yeah, if you have a dislocation in, an, in a half plane, it goes to the boundary of this half plane, and we can compute the, the heating time, the exit time from the boundary wave. 
And we computed the same thing for the circle and the many dislocations in, in a half plane as well. Yeah, those are actually in the paper that I should mention is in collaboration with Tim Bless, Irene Fonseca, Leoni, and it will appear on uh, IF possibly here. It's been accepted by most of the titles. You know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we have those cases. We have the, the, the one dislocation in a half plane, and we can perfectly compute the, the, the exit time. And that depends on the, on the arrangement of the glide directions. Actually, it was a question before. Uh, it definitely goes slower if it doesn't follow the, the glide direction. And if it's performing fine cross slip as well, the, the vector, the magnitude of the velocity that you get is, is, is smaller than uh, your, full, uh, your full force because of the projection, of course. And uh, computations can be done also, also in a disk. Uh, you just need to go to polar coordinates and do a, a whole lot of computations, but it's, it's just tedious, but it can be done. And one dislocation in a disk is in an unstable equilibrium if it sits at the center because of symmetry reasons. So it would be attracted to all parts of the boundary so it doesn't move. But as soon as it, it is a little farther away from the center, it, it tries to, to go out of the boundary. So if the, that radius is an admissible glide direction, it will just follow it. Otherwise, it will just go a little bit skewed from that, but it will stay at the bottom. And uh, they will actually move because uh, a fundamental assumption here is that the, the span of the of G, of the set of the glide direction is, uh, glide directions is R2. So the conditions on that that I forgot to mention, and I apologize for that, are that if a glide direction lives in the set G, then its opposite lives as well, so you can go backwards and forwards. And uh, uh, you have to have at least two to cover the whole plane. Because one case would be this one. So you would have the half plane, and the only admissible direction would be this, but the force uh, is directed in this way. So in this case, you wouldn't move, because the scalar product would give you zero. But there can be only one glide direction. There, there must be another one as well. So wherever the other one is, uh, is located, that's the one that, the, that this dislocation will follow in that case. Yes. Well, the model is deterministic, okay? So we don't do any stochastics in no, here. Uh, well, it, it works mathematically, which is, which is fine by me at the first place, and it's in agreement with experimental results. So engineers uh, take movies of dislocations and they observe them to follow curvy lines. And also, having like an infinite vertical cylinder or an infinite straight cylinder is quite a modeling assumption, because when you have real pieces of materials, they are finite. So these locations move along lines and go around. So they move along curves as well. Yes. 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 So in the simulations that team ran and uh, Basically, you would do this. If you want, this could be a good starting point for uh, discretizing the, the, the procedure and going to the and then going to the limit. But it's what we're trying to do with minimizing movement for uh, for getting to the uh, framework of the gradient phase. Basically, so you decide a direction, and you only have to pick one. And you do it with that. that. That's the one that maximizes. And if you discretize time at a time, time step tau, then you, you actually do zigzagging. So you can see it as a, as a faster time scale that's happening here when it undergoes fine cross slip. No, 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 you cannot. You cannot. Yes. 
Yeah, probably. Um, we didn't listen to that, so I, I'm not really sure how to reply to this question. But. Well, why not? I don't know. So then I think that in a deterministic world, uh, you want to be able to predict where the dislocation goes. And uh, if you have an ambiguity situation, you want to be able to solve it. Uh, I, I believe we didn't compute it, AL, but we could observe it in numerical simulation. So Tim ran. Yeah, so if you encounter one, you do that. And actually, Tim had like 12 dislocations in a disk with random initial conditions, and he ran the dynamics for a bit. And then we see either straight lines or curvy lines or uh, switches of, of, of directions. Uh, well, the way I would compute it, probably, is to fix uh, all the dislocations but one, say the first one, and I want to find A1 by computing all those objects. So by computing J1 of Z dotted with uh, G, and then to take the max. When I have any point Z where two of these are the maximizing one, that leaves, that to me leaves in A, in the, in A1 in a curly A1. And then you would have to do it this for, uh, but then you have to compute this not on the dislocations. So G, this Z here, let, let me call it Z tilde probably, and it's all the two to N fixed, uh, and uh, the location of the first one is, 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 is uh, it can be moved. So if you find a point to a little x, say, where that uh, gives you two different Gs, then that point leaves in the, in the, in the ambiguity. Yes, I mean, the, the constraint that defines A is, is, is very subtle. I mean, it, it, to us, it was kind of difficult to speak. And uh, of course, the AL can move in time because the arrangement of, the whole of all the dislocations 